Hey everyone, Sam here and welcome to my channel and welcome to the first YouTube video of 2020. In this video I'm going to show you some of my painting process and how my painting projects begin, which nearly always start off with me going out to the location that I want to paint, taking reference photos and, if I can, doing a plein air painting which I'll bring back to the studio. Just recently I visited a place called Topor Bay which is about an hour away from where I live in northern New Zealand. It's a stunning location and it was actually my friend Andrew Tischler that told me about this place as he was also up there painting a few months ago. So in this video I shall show you my painting process where I demonstrate how I painted a plein air painting whilst I was there. In the second part of the video, once I've got my photo reference, I show you how I begin to design a composition in my sketchbook. Now at the moment this painting project's only got as far as the final sketch, so there's still a colour study to do before I get into the final painting. But I'll be making some videos on this process as well, so stay tuned for those. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Anyway, sit back, relax and enjoy the video. Alrighty, so I'm just about to head off to Topor Beach. It's about an hour and 20 minutes drive from here. I'm just in Kerry Kerry at the moment, just been to the supermarket to grab some stuff for lunch. Got all my paints in the back, so I'm ready to go. Alright, so I'm here at Topor Bay and I'm going to set up my painting gear and get painting. I think I'm going to paint that over there. Put it all down the beach first. Right, so I've got my Peshaw box easel here all set up. This is made by a guy called Ben Haggart who lives in Missouri. Uh, with his company Alaprima Pichard and he hand makes all these Pichard boxes and they're so nice to paint with um, so I definitely recommend one of these um, we've got a compartment for storing paints and a pallet which just clips on the side and then you put your panel there this is a source tech linen panel made by canvaspanels.com in the USA so check them out as well and this is brilliant because it moves up and down because there's lots of magnets in this Pichard box so it's really intuitive to paint with also storage space to put your paintings in there so there we go Got my colours all laid out and now I'm going to start a painting. I'm working on an 8x10 linen panel and I think these are perfect for plein air painting because they're big enough to be impactful but small enough that you can quickly capture the moment and the atmosphere of what you're painting. I start my painting by quickly sketching out my composition using a number one round brush and some burnt sienna that's mixed with liquid. And I'm going to be using liquid as my medium as this is an alkyd resin that speeds up the drying time but also improves the flow of the paint. So this is brilliant for painting outdoors. Now as I sketch out my composition I'll just quickly go over the colours that I'll be using for this painting. The colours I'm using include titanium white, burnt sienna, yellow oxide, cadmium yellow, cadmium orange, quinacridone crimson, ultramarine blue and phthalo green. It's a fairly limited palette but I believe you can paint any landscape or seascape with these colours. So now I've got my composition sketched out, I've made the headland the main focal area and the small stream along the beach is leading the eye towards it. The cliffs are high, but I've also made the horizon line of the sea lower. 
Now you might have heard me say this in my other videos, but never have the horizon line in the middle of the painting. Either go for a low horizon or a high horizon, especially in seascapes. Having the horizon line in the middle of the painting will spoil the composition. So my composition's all laid out and now I'm ready to paint. But before I really start thinking about getting in some solid colour in there, my first priority is to establish the dark values in the painting. And value is how light or dark a subject is. By painting my darks first, it's going to be easier to establish the overall tonality of the painting and create atmospheric perspective. The other reason for painting your dark values first is it's going to make it much easier for me to get the colours right when I come to paint the areas that are in light and also to get the values right. So I think by establishing the darks first it starts to set up the foundation for the painting. Now here I've started off by painting the headland and I'm going to use that to gauge the rest of the tonality of the painting. The value of the rocks in the cliffs are a kind of mid-tone so I don't want my shadows to be too dark. So for this I mix a combination of ultramarine blue and I desaturate it with some burnt sienna. I also add in some titanium white to get the value that I want and then I mix in a little quinacridone crimson that just gives it a violet edge. I'm using a number six flat brush as I'm trying to use the biggest brushes I can get away with so I can have that more painterly effect. And using the same colours but with more titanium white, I start blocking in those cloud shadows. I'm likely to find my darkest shadows within the foreground of the painting, so I want these shadows to be darker than the headland. And again, I'm using the same colours, which includes ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, some quinacridone crimson, but a lot less titanium white to make the value of that colour darker. So now I've established the main area of my dark values and I painted them quickly. I'm going to come back to them later on in the painting. So next I'm going to focus on the clouds and the sky. I immediately get straight into the cloud highlights and this is a combination of titanium white with some burnt sienna mixed in but only a small amount. And this just gives the white an orange cast to it. As I've also used these two colours in the cloud shadows, they're going to mix in nicely and I'm actually not worried that the cloud highlights are going to mix in with the shadows. In fact, I want them to. I'm going to keep the colour of the sky really simple and it's just a mix of titanium white with some ultramarine blue. Now one thing I've noticed through painting outdoors is that the sky towards the horizon tends to be lighter and less saturated than the sky above you, which in New Zealand on a clear day tends to be a deeper blue. So when I'm applying paint to the upper section of my painting, I just mix in a little bit more ultramarine blue. I'm still using a number six flat brush and I paint the sea with a combination of ultramarine blue with a little yellow oxide and a little phthalo green. And for the wave in the foreground, I use a bit more phthalo green and some more yellow oxide. Here I'm leaving a gap above the wave so I can paint the white water on the crest of the wave. I mix in some titanium white into my existing sea mix to lighten the value so I can paint some of that lighter water in the foreshore. Once I've finished painting the sea, I start moving on to the areas of the painting that are in light. So I go back to the rocks and cliff faces and I start painting those. Some of these rocks are quite dark, but I still use the same colours that I used in the shadows. But I mix in some more titanium white to make the value lighter. This is also going to make the colour of the rocks look more harmonious with the shadows. For the cliff faces on the headland, I make the tone a little lighter so that it sits back in the painting. I'm also using a dagger brush for the cliffs in the headland 
to get some sharper edges and finer marks. The great thing about dagger brushes is that you can use the flat end for broader marks and you can use the tip of the brush for finer detail. It's a very versatile brush to use whether you're painting outdoors or using it for studio painting. I switch back to using a number 6 flat brush and I start painting in a few of those lighter tones that are on the side of the cliff. There are some light golden yellows amongst that rich green foliage. And for this I mix yellow oxide with some burnt sienna, a little ultramarine blue and some titanium white. And this is going to add a bit of interest to the side of the cliff. Whenever I paint outdoors I always try and paint quickly as the light and weather is always changing. So I want to quickly get the rest of this colour down on the side of the cliff just in case it clouds over. I use this existing golden yellow mix that I've just made and I turn it into a green by adding in some more yellow oxide, a little ultramarine blue and a little cadmium yellow and then I round it off with a bit of quinacridone crimson. I want to keep the chroma of the green on the headland a little lower than compared with the cliffs in the foreground as this is going to make it sit back and recede a little in the painting. Chroma is another word for saturation and it just means how pure and vibrant the colour is. So for example the sand on the beach is low in chroma and it's light in value. The foliage on the main cliff is a bit more saturated and there's also a variety of greens on there. So I still use my existing green mix but I start introducing some more cadmium yellow and ultramarine blue. Cadmium yellow is a much more intense yellow and high in chroma so it's great for mixing some saturated greens that you'd find in grass and leaves in the foreground. If my green's looking a little too cold I can warm it up with some yellow oxide or by introducing in some cadmium orange or quinacridone crimson which just helps to balance it out and make it look more natural. I use my green mix to cover most of the cliff and then I'm going to add in a few patches of grass which is much lighter in value but the colour is still quite saturated. Up here in northern New Zealand you get some really vibrant greens. So again I'm still going to continue to use my green mix which is mostly cadmium yellow with ultramarine blue, a little yellow oxide and a little cadmium orange and quinacridone crimson. This rounds off the green and makes it look more natural. But then I also introduced titanium white which is going to make the value lighter and also it desaturates the green a little. Once I've established the major zones of shadows and colours in the cliffs, I leave it for a moment because I'm going to come back to it a bit later on in the painting, by which time the liquid will have dried a little bit so I'll be able to layer some thicker paint over that initial paint layer. So now I'm going to turn my attention back to the sea and I'm going to start painting some white water on the crest of those waves and the white water in the foreshore. This is going to give more of a three-dimensional form to the breaking wave and mark a defined zone between the ocean and the beach. For this I'm still using a number six flat brush and I'm using my cloud highlight mix which was a combination of titanium white with a little burnt sienna mixed in. I use my sky mix to paint the water in the stream that's leading towards the sea and then I move on to the sand. The value of the sand is light and as I said earlier the sand is not particularly high in chroma so for this I start with a combination of titanium white mixed with some yellow oxide and then I mix in just a little bit of ultramarine blue and then I round off the colour with some burnt sienna which is going to take the green out of it. If the sand is looking too pale I can just add in a bit more yellow oxide. At this stage of the painting I'm happy with the way it's progressing so 
I'm now going to start tidying it up. I begin by restating some of those dark areas and shadows, especially in the cliffs and rocks. I'm using my dagger brush to sharpen up and tidy some of those edges. I add a few more shadows in the side of the cliff just to define and shape some of those trees. And this is a mix of ultramarine blue with a little yellow oxide and a small amount of burnt sienna. At this point in the painting I had to readjust the position of my pochard box because the sun had moved and it was starting to shine on my painting. When I paint outdoors I much prefer to paint with my linen panel in shadow because that way I'm not getting any glare off the painting. Also if I can achieve some nice vibrant looking colours whilst painting in shadow it's going to look even better when I turn it round into the light or if it's hanging on a wall under studio lights. I'm now just going to work across the painting adding a few more details but essentially I'm using the same colours that I used in the initial paint layers. I'm now just adding a few more details to the side of the cliff. I blend in and tidy up the clouds and overall I'm just adding a few more details to refine the painting. Now as this is a plein air painting I don't really want it overly detailed, in fact I quite like that painterly impressionist look so this is my chance to loosen up my brushwork. I tend to keep my plein air paintings loose and gestural whereas my studio paintings are much more detailed. I actually like both style of paintings so for me this is the way I can get the best of both worlds. For any of you that have watched any of my other videos will see that I do paint outdoors a lot. I really enjoy it and I find plein air painting actually quite addictive. I also love being outside in the fresh air and the sun. And most of all it gives me loads of inspiration for paintings. But the other thing I love about plein air painting is you never know what you're going to come back with at the end of the day. When I begin a new painting project, I always like to go to the location and if I can, I'll produce a field painting whilst I'm there, although it's not always possible. I'll also be taking lots of reference photos. Photos are obviously very useful to an artist, but they also have their limitations as often the colours can be distorted. So having an additional field painting or two can be very useful when you come to paint a studio artwork. It's all about gathering as much information as you can. I'm pretty happy with this plein air painting and I'll be able to use this information in the studio when I begin the painting project. I'm now back in my studio. I've got my field painting and a ton of reference photos. So now I want to begin the design process of my painting. So the first thing I do is I download my photos to my computer and then go through them and narrow down and select the ones that I'm going to use for my painting. Once I've selected a load of photos that I'm going to use, the next thing to do is to start designing the composition and this always begins in my sketchbook. I begin by drawing a few small rectangles in my sketchbook and then I spend between two and five minutes just doing some quick rough sketches to get an idea for a composition. And then when I've got an idea for a composition I then spend some time doing a detailed pencil sketch and I'm going to use this for my painting as this serves as the blueprint. Now I will be making some more detailed videos on pencil sketching but for this video I just wanted to show this as part of my process. My final pencil sketch serves as a solid composition 
that I can copy when I begin my final painting. It's also going to give me an overall idea of what the tonality of the painting could look like. I'm using a range of graphite pencils, including hard pencils, such as a 4H, which produces light marks, which are great for clouds and distant landforms, and grass, for example. Then, to produce much darker values in my drawing, I'll use a 4B or a 6B, which are soft pencils that produce dark marks. I also sometimes use a clutch pencil for finer details within my drawing. Now, I know pencil sketching can seem a bit boring sometimes and you just want to get into your painting, but trust me, this will really help you with your painting process and it'll help you to get inspired, so have fun with it. Your drawings don't have to be perfect or anything, but it is an exciting way of creating lots of different compositions in a short space of time, and it will definitely help you to produce a more solid painting. Now my pencil sketch is complete, the next stage of this painting project will be to paint a colour study. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. And as I said at the start, this painting project has only got as far as the final sketch at the moment, but I'll be making more videos when I come to paint the colour study and the final painting, so stay tuned for those. If you've got any comments or suggestions, or suggestions for future videos, please leave them in the comments section below. And also, thank you to those that have already left comments for future videos. I have acknowledged them and they're on the list of future videos for me to make. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe to my channel, but also subscribe to my website at samuelerp.com where I've got lots of painting resources on there, including written painting tutorials that you can copy and paint along with, and also in-depth painting videos, so check that out there. Anyway, thanks again for watching, happy painting, and I'll see you in the next video coming soon. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about painting, then check out the painting resources on my website at samuelerp.com. My painting blog has lots of free written painting tutorials and reference photos that you can paint along with. I have a selection of in-depth painting videos where I show you how to paint an artwork from start to finish, including how to mix the colours which I demonstrate on my palette and Art Theory Made Easy, which I explain in the context of each video, so you can learn as you paint. And I also have a painting tutorial video subscription service on my Patreon profile at patreon.com forward slash Samuel underscore Earp underscore artist. All the website links can be found in the description below. Thanks for watching and happy painting.